So we'll uh, talk about facial bars. Uh, first described by John Hunter, he was uh, looking at uh, chickens and uh, he found that the longitudinal bone growth was due to new bone generated by physis at the end of the long bones. And uh, this was long before x-rays were done. And so when, uh, when he found out that there was a dye that the chicken, when they were eating it, it went into the bone and then he found that the dye was migrating and that's how he found out that what is the growing end of the bone, how does the bone grow. So he's considered the father of gro uh, growth plate. Uh, if you have a physal disturbance, you can get angular deformity, limb length discrepancy, or a joint distortion, or a combination. So he is a nine-year-old boy, wasn't treated very well, and after eight years, you know, he is short and he has a deformity. That's a significant issue. How do you correct this? You need, uh, you know, deformity correction as well as lengthening. So it's better to treat it right at the first time. The factors that predict growth disturbances are the physis that is affected and the type of physal injury, as you heard from the uh, speakers before me, and the maturity of the patient. So if, uh, for example, this is a 12-year-old female, they usually stop growing at around 13. Um, so if this patient has a growth arrest six months later, it's not going to be that big of an issue because the patient is nearing skeletal maturity. If we looked at the physial map, this is, a, this is how a mapping is done. You look at the cross-sectional area of the physis and the area of the bar, and then you can have a percentage of how much of the physis is affected. So for a 13-year-old female, it doesn't matter if the bar is 50%, 70%, as long as it's not gonna grow, there is not gonna be any, if there is no growth, there is not going to be any deformity, so it may not need anything. The type of physal disturbances, you can get loss of physis, or we can have a physis that appears to be intact and no bar, but it may not grow. It's called sick physis. And then you have a physal arrest, and there are different names. When you look at the literature, it's bony bar or physal bar, bone bridge, growth arrest. All means the same, that there is bone across the physis. You can have loss of physis like this patient uh, with a type uh, 6 uh, sort of uh, uh, modification. Uh, and uh, you can have a growth arrest. Uh, this is, uh, we talked about this uh, in the previous classification, Peterson type uh, 6 uh, fracture where uh, it's a loss of physis. Also ha happens commonly on the medial, medial malleolus because of uh, a, a, a road, road traffic accident. Uh, sick physis, the physis may appear uh, normal but does not grow normally, whether it's infection, vascular insult, trauma, or tumor. Seen in younger patients, here is an example of a physis that at one year later appears to be okay, but then uh, at two years it starts to close down in a younger patient, and that's not the normal order of closure. So the sick physis may not grow or may close early. A physial bar, the way to diagnose is you can just follow the Park Harris line, and it usually points towards the area of growth arrest. So you see the Park Harris line here, and it's described by these two guys, Park and Harris, in 1926-27. And if your uh, Park Harris line, which is a growth recovery line, if it's parallel to the physis, that means your normal growth here, and here you can see it's not parallel to the physis. It is pointing towards the area of the growth arrest. And then uh, this is 40% uh, bar, even though it may appear to be really small on an x-ray, you need to get uh, advanced imaging to assess the amount of physis that is affected. Uh, you can do a CT, which is ideal for bone bridge visualiz visualization. The MRI shows the architecture of the physis. So this is a gradient, gradient echo with fat saturation, which shows you the um, uh, map, uh, which helps to create the maps. Uh, we also get full length weight bearing x-ray to evaluate the limb length as well as the deformity. A scanogram is, can also be used, but I use a full length x-ray and just calculate. Since everything is digital now, you, it's easy to calculate the, the discrepancy. You need to estimate the skeletal age and the remaining growth, and uh, I, I usually use a left hand x-ray, but you can do uh, different uh, uh, areas. Uh, yeah, I think elbow is also very popular, at least here. And um, you can also do it based on MRI. Uh, you know, the recent atlas is MRI of the knee. So if you're looking at a knee uh, growth arrest, you can just look at the MRI and look, uh, and you can estimate the bone age. These are the high-risk growth plates, the distal tibia, proximal tibia, distal ulna, and distal femur. Uh, I think the distal femur and proximal uh, tibia are close to around 50%. Distal ulna is 50%, but you, uh, we don't see the injury that often. And the reason that it's a high growth arrest rate is because it takes a significant amount of force to fracture the distal ulna. So when you have a high energy injury, there is high rate of growth arrest. 
uh, three types of five cell arrest. It could be central, where there is an island um, of uh, growth arrest. Uh, it could be, uh, it can lead to tenting of the articular surface. It could be peripheral on the edge, and it can lead to a progressive angular deformity, or it could be a linear from front to back, an entire bar, and then it's usually seen in Salter three and four, which grows, which, which are fractures across the physis. Uh, so how do you manage it? There are different types of intervention. You can do a bar resection. You can just ignore the bar and then address the deformity or the limb length discrepancy. You can close the remaining part of the physis, which is epiphysiodesis, and then manage the deformity. Or you can simply, simply observe if the bar is when the patient is near skeletal maturity. So if you have more than two years of growth remaining, you need to estimate the size of the bar, depending on what size you have. So if you have less than 30% bar, it's a good uh, bar to resect, um, especially if it's post-traumatic. And if it's more than 30%, then you may have to do repeated osteotomies during growth. It's usually if you time it well, it is two times or two osteotomies. If the patient is younger, uh, then uh, eight or 10 years of age. Or you can do an epiphysiodesis and then do a limb length uh, deformity and uh, discrepancy management later. And if you have an angular deformity, then you can uh, consider doing an osteotomy. If it's uh, less than 20 degrees, then you can do a hemiepiphysiodesis. Um, if you have less than two years remaining growth, you probably can just do an observation. So this is kind of an algorithm of uh, thinking. It, you know, one is how much growth is remaining. If you have more growth remaining, then you need to estimate the amount of physis that is affected to see if you have to resect it or you need to complete or manage the, uh, the deformity. So these are all the options. So physal by resection, also knows, known as epiphysiolysis, uh, first described by Langenskold uh, uh, for Blount um, and um, uh, he, de he defined the staging of Blount disease, and he was the first one to perform bar resection and fat interposition. Uh, you attempt a section if more than two years of growth remaining or more than two centimeters of uh, growth remaining, that's one principle. You put the marking wires in the epiphysis and the metaphysis so you can then know if it's growing from the physis, and uh, you have some interposition materials in between. You attempt a section only in the physis involvement is less than 30%. You don't do it for bigger, uh, bigger bars. Uh, if you, and you perform simultaneous osteotomy if there is angular deformity of more than 20 degrees, but it depends on the area. If there is significant ankle varus of more than 10 degrees, you may want to uh, do an osteotomy as well. Uh, these are the different ways of doing osteotomies. You can go into the bar from the top. You can do an osteotomy. And then from the osteotomy site, you can go and resect the bar. Here is a case of a 12-year-old male uh, with an ATV accident, right leg deformity. This is what he has. You can see there is reversal of the tibial slope. Normal tibial slope is posterior about 8 to 10 degrees. And here you can see that the, uh, there is a reversal of the slope of about uh, 10 degrees anterior tilt compared to 8 to 10 degrees posterior tilt. Um, and you can see that this is a central bar. It's post-traumatic, so ideal for resection, especially if it's less than 30%. So looking at this uh, algorithm, the patient has angular deformity and uh, uh, has less than 30% bar. So you can do a hemipisiodesis and you can do a physial bar resection. That's what was done. This is how I do it. I put a guide wire in the center of the physis for central arrest. And then I use a reamer, uh, an ACL reamer on top. And uh, then I put my scope into the uh, track and I can check, make sure that I can see physis all the way around. You can see the white physis with the scope. That means your bar is adequately resected. And you can, uh, you know, some people have used the dental mirror that you can put in and check all the way around to make sure that you see the physis. You have to make sure that if there is bone across the physis, then it's not gonna grow. So you wanna make sure your resection is, is adequate. And then I inject this uh, cement. You can inject regular cement, or this is cranioplast. The advantage, advantage of using uh, cranioplast is that it's radiolucent, uh, so it doesn't interfere. In, in if there is a new, new bar formation, you'll be able to see it. If you have cement, you would not know if there is, again, a new bar formation. But with the cranioplast, you can see it because it's, it's radiolucent. And the other advantage is that the, it's not an exothermic reaction when it's setting. The conventional cement gives, out, gives heat which can be damaging to the physis, whereas with the cranioplast, it's not exothermic. Uh, this is a one-year post-op. Uh, you see the marking wires here in the epiphysis and the metaphysis. Those are the marking wires for, to assess the growth later on. The staples are a form of um, growth modulation. I placed it posterior because the patient had um, uh, anterior tilting of the physis. 
and uh, then you see some uh, uh, other hardware in there. So this is uh, at one year he has developed five degrees of uh, posterior um, uh, inclination of the tibia. Another example, 13-year-old male, right ankle injury eight months ago and has right ankle deformity and medial sided pain. These are the initial x-rays. At Salter, one of the distal tibia, eight months later has this growth arrest. And this is a contralateral side. We estimate the patient has more than two years of growth remaining. If the, if the phalanges of the distal, if the physis of the distal phalanges are open, the patient has more than two years of growth remaining. So even if you don't know anything else about bone age, just get a hand x-ray and look at the distal phalanges. If the physis are open, they have more than two years of growth remaining. So that may be an easy way to, to know whether you can resect or not. And uh, when you look at this, there is an angulation at the ankle. Um, we got a CT scan which showed a peripheral bar. And then a central bar as well. So if you have two bars, it's difficult to excise both bars. I'm just going to skip over this. This is uh, a uh, suppressed, uh, fat suppressed uh, image to look at the mapping of the physial bar. And uh, this is a physial map, 50% bone bridge. So 50% is a little bit too much. So uh, we did not attempt um, uh, the resection in this case. Uh, I'm just going to skip this. These are different ways of doing MRI. Uh, if they have more than 30%, then your options are epiphysiodesis and then managing uh, limb length discrepancy later on, or you can do osteotomies during growth. So here is an epiphysiodesis of the same case that I was showing that we did not do a bar resection. We went on to complete the, uh, the remaining physis. It's just a matter of <coughs> drilling. Just make sure you use a bigger drill bit, usually a 3 or 3.5 drill bit, to drill across the physis, and then you can, uh, it, you can do it percutaneously. Uh, under fluoro control, and then um, uh, this is going anteriorly, going posteriorly through the same entry hole, and then I use a curette, uh, and you can curette the uh, the um, uh, the epiphysis uh, uh, epiphyseal side of the um, of the growth plate, as seen here. And um, I'll show you another example of a nine-year-old boy playing basketball and and uh, tripped on a ball and uh, had this injury. It's difficult to know, so I'm going to point it out what the injury is. It's a shear type fracture of the medial femoral condyle with an associated osseous edema and periosteal hemorrhage. This is a typical perichondrial ring injury that we talked about. You can see on the medial side here. See, there is no fracture on the x-ray, but the, uh, the perichondrial ring has been pulled up uh, with this injury. If you look at the CT scan, there is a thin sliver of bone. And you would not anticipate a growth arrest with this uh, based on the imaging. But there is significant damage to the perichondrial ring in this area as seen on the MRI. So we treated him in a cast for four weeks. And I didn't see the patient back for a year and a half. And then when he came back, he had this. He had mild varus developing. I, I said, let's just observe and see. And, but the MRI showed that he had this bar. And the patient had progressive deformity. This is a year after that. So then we decided we need to treat it. And uh, we reused navigation and uh, uh, um, in a hybrid room. That means that we have imaging. Um, this is how it's done. You can, uh, we can get a CT scan pre-op. That is, uh, pre-op means it is still done intra-op, but before intervention. We get a CT scan, and we can draw this. And then the navigation can help you guide your uh, uh, localize the bar and then we just drill on top of it. It's pretty easy. You can see two drill holes, and then we just use an onger to combine those two. So very small incision, peripheral bar uh, uh, with, uh, with the help of navigation. And then I did a guided growth because the patient was going into varus, so that corrected his, uh, his varus. I won't go into prevention. We already heard that for Salter 1 and 2, um, it, most of the time it would remodel, so you don't try and manipulate it after five to seven days. And for three and four, you need anatomic reduction in internal fixation. I usually have not done for a long time. I like to hear what the faculty does. I don't do arthrogram or I don't do any opening. I just do percutaneous fixation of all medial malleolus, stilo fractures. And I don't uh, routinely, I mean, for lateral condyle, condyl, we get it. But stilo fractures and medial malleolus, a little bit older patients, you can see the bone very well. And always stabilize. Any displaced distal femur or physial fracture, always stabilize. Don't just reduce. It needs fixation. And um, respect the physis. <coughs> you can do fat interposition. If you don't have cement, that's the option. And some, uh, uh, some reports of endometriosis uh, for prevention as well. Thank you. Thank you, Shita.
Thank you.